What's up, everybody? I'm Katie. And I'm Morgan. And this is For Your Misinformation, a podcast dedicated to empowering women to be more politically engaged so we can act in our own best interests. Let us break down the problem and tell you what we're doing and what you can do to help solve it. Hi, Morgan. Hi, Katie. What is up? It is a really nice day here, and I'm very excited about the episode that we have today. Oh my gosh, me too. Oh my gosh, everything that's up is just wonderful. How are you today? I'm good. Um, Yeah, I... I've been bird watching today. I've been doing... Working on the podcast from... um, our dining room where we I can see like all day like female and male cardinals and indigo buntings and just all these cool birds and it's very soothing and nice I'm into it that sounds lovely yeah and I needed it because I was like kind of anxious for this recording because we have an interview for you guys with Kate Kelly yeah like the Kate Kelly the podcaster of the ordinary equality podcast feminist like even her wikipedia page has her name parentheses feminist Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do you know why that is (laughs) it's because there's a kate kelly who's like a newscaster yeah there's another kate kelly also there's lots of kate kelly's out there um there was a girl i ran against in high school cross country whose name was kate kelly were you faster than her I was terrified of her. I was a freshman who had no idea what I was doing. She was a senior. I was very scared of her. Mm. Um, The first time I beat her, I was so excited. Like I was freaking out because like, oh my gosh, I was like so scared of her. She was like Mm -hmm. an idol, you know, or whatever. Um, I was a lot faster than her. Like like, as a freshman, I had no clue what I was doing. No, I get it. So nice. Oh. But no, this Kate I'm Kelly Kate is Kelly. a human right human rights attorney. Yeah, like a human rights attorney. That is everything I would want to be in my life mm-hmm. if I felt like I could possibly take her law school. Yeah, I barely have the energy to get through my days now. Yeah. But okay, let's give a brief so brief so coronavirus excited. update. It's May 12th, um, as of right now, there have been 83,261 deaths from coronavirus. Dr. Fauci estimates that that's probably a low number. Um, Yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's what's going on. Yeah. um, I'm in Iowa, as we all know. Mm -hmm. Nothing here has changed. It's all still a mess. Great. But that's okay. I like, can't even be that mad about it because I'm, I'm so Kelly. excited about yeah. Kate Kelly yeah. being on our podcast. <gasps> so, okay. So for some context that listeners might need before going into the interview, um, the Constitution has no protections based on gender the way it is right now. Um, when it was drafted originally by the Founding Fathers, it was written by a group of um really, really disproportionately rich men, uh, rich white men. And they made an, made a decision not to include women as a protected class in the Constitution. There were other constitutions being written by other nations that already included women as a protected class. Our founding fathers were like, mm, nah, because women were property back then. And it, one of the things that I like about the podcast is that, and like you and I know how important messaging is, they, at the beginning of every single episode, remind you that when the Constitution was written, women were regarded as property. And it is kind of just like, oh, yeah, that's right. Like, of course I'm not in here. Like, of course I'm not protected. That's how they viewed women back then. And that's how it still is today. Yeah, it still is that way today. There are so many parallels. Yeah. And it's terrifying yeah. that it's taken this long to just now even have the equal rights amendment be at a place where yes we might be able to get this thing done finally now that virginia the 38th state ratified it we finally might be able to get something done but it's still going to be really hard 
Um, but yeah, wow. most people think that there already are provisions in our constitution protecting women. They're not there. Um, so yeah. And then I, just as a reminder, uh, I, the electoral college was designed at the same time as the three fifths compromise as a way to give more power to states where slavery was legal, just to keep that in mind when you think, I mean, hopefully when you think of the three fifths compromise, you're like, Oh, that's some racist shit. That was developed at the same time and for the same reason as the Electoral College. So just keep in mind when you hear Electoral College, like, oh, that's designed to give a disproportionate amount of power and votes to a disproportionate amount of, or you you get what I'm saying, too much yeah. power for people that don't represent the majority of the population. Yep. So, yep. Not great, but. Not great. Um, but. Kate Kelly had a lot of really awesome stuff to say. Oh my gosh, so awesome. And um, I think you guys are really going to like it. Yes, so um, give it up, give a warm welcome and a huge thank you to our guest, human rights lawyer, podcaster, feminist, and our equal rights amendment mom, Kate Kelly. Woo woo! <laughs> I just ooh ooh, I'm not even a woo girl. Okay, well, we are very excited and we can just go ahead and get started right away so that we don't take up like too much of your time or anything. Um, cool. Yeah, so we're, we're very excited. Um, I guess kind of um, our first question that we had for you was how did you get interested in the Equal Rights Amendment? Were you always uh, feminist or was there just a moment that you were like, you know what, I was born to change the world. And then you just started kicking ass. Like, how did that, how did that happen? Uh, so I was raised Mormon, uh, which is a very conservative anti-feminist religion. And my mother and grandmother both fought against the ERA in the 1970s. So that's how I learned about it growing up, that it was bad, that it was wrong, that it was going to destroy society and the family as we know it. Uh, and so I grew up thinking that it was a very negative thing. Uh, I went to law school and in law school, I started studying obviously constitutional law and realizing, wait, women are not in this. Like women are not in it. Women are not covered by it. It doesn't work for us it does it we're not equal under our own most basic law and then I started realizing you know it's women like my mother and my grandmother that kept us out of the constitution that kept the equal rights amendment from being ratified the first time around and so after I graduated from, um, after I graduated from law school is when I got involved in uh, the ratification movement Oh, so awesome. Yeah. Um, so what are people's general reasons for being against the ERA? Like, do they have personal attachment to it? Is it just general, like, political sentiment? Yeah. So the Equal Rights Amendment is pretty simple. It, the main clause just says equality of rights shall not be abridged or denied by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That's it. It's 24 words. It's pretty hard to imagine someone being against that. Yeah. <laughs> However, <laughs> there are people who oppose the Equal Rights Amendment and the ratification still to this day. And many of the arguments that they used in the 1970s are now moot. So mm -hmm. at the time, they would say, well, it's going to cause gay marriage. We already have that. They would say it's going to make women uh, be, you know, serve in all levels of the military that already happens it's going to cause women to be drafted was a major argument in the 1970s because they had just gone through vietnam and that was a really big and realistic fear for a lot of people and so all of these arguments at this point are moot um but the main argument that people still use or or kind of set of arguments are still very much culture war arguments. So they'll say that it will cause trans people to get additional rights, mm. which they see as a bad. Um, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, I've got two dogs there. So excited about everything. Sorry. Great, great. 
Um, so people who oppose the Equal Rights Amendment think, you know, the negatives of it will be it will increase rights. So it will cover trans people. Um, it will cover they think it will cover access to abortion. That's one of their major arguments against the Equal Rights Amendment, that it will protect the constitutional right we already have to access abortion care. So those are the things they use now, but really fundamentally what they're against is men and women being equal and being treated so under the law. And I, I know that I have definitely had people say this to me, and I know that you probably have for sure, when people also use the argument that, well, we don't need it because sexism is over. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what do you say to that? Yeah, I mean, that's fun. <laughs> uh, glad that happened. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't realize it. Yeah, a lot of people, it's funny, you hear the argument from both men and women mm-hmm. that we don't need it anymore, that we're equal already. Um, and you know, a lot of women will say, I feel equal. Um, and what I usually say to that is equality is not a feeling. It doesn't matter if you feel respected in your community. It doesn't matter if you feel satisfied with the roles and treatment that you get, that does not make men and women in our, uh, country or in our world equal. And there are many measurable ways that we know that men and women are not equal. The statistics bear that out time and time again, whether it's the wage gap or just looking in Congress. (laughs) We just recently had the biggest female class ever elected to Congress and it's barely 24%. So you can just look at the way our government works and you know that men and women are not equal. It's very obvious. Uh, but they say that because they, it's, it's now unpopular to argue that men and women shouldn't be equal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So they've sort of catapulted over it and said, like, we got there, you know, like Mm -hmm. we took the train to the promised land and we have arrived and men and women are equal. Uh, except for, of course, they wanted to skip the step of actually making that true. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you explain, in the podcast, your podcast, Ordinary Equality, you talk about the importance of the two L's, litigation and legislation. Can you talk about that in terms of, I guess, people arguing that we are already equal and how you can use that to say, well, look, no, we're not. Yeah. So um, the two ways that the Equal Rights Amendment are going to help us One is the first clause, which will help us with litigation. So when a woman is discriminated against, she files a case and she takes that case as high as she needs to go to get redress. Sometimes that will go all the way to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court has decided that women get what's called intermediate scrutiny when they are discriminated against. It's sort of a lower judicial review. It's not the best. Mm -hmm. It's second class. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're discriminated against on the basis of race or religion or national origin, these other protected classes, you get what's called strict scrutiny, which is the highest level, the best protection. Um, It's very hard to pass and keep those laws on the books. Women get this other category that's lesser. Um, So it's harder to win cases uh, when the discrimination is discrimination is on the basis of sex. So the Equal Rights Amendment will help bump us up from that sort of second class, you know, lower tier uh, standard to this higher standard. So that's, it'll help us win our litigation. Um, The second reason the Equal Rights Amendment will help us is in the second clause, which says that Congress has the power to enforce it. Um, Right now, the federal government is only allowed certain things under the constitution. They're only allowed to pass certain kinds of laws and everything else is left up to the states. So they're actually pretty limited in what they can and can't do. Uh, And so one of those ways, it's actually really hard to pass laws to protect women. And for example, the Violence Against Women Act, the Violence Against Women Act has to be sort of uh, shimmied into our law through the constitution under what's called the Interstate Commerce Clause. So the federal government can regulate interstate commerce, which means like 
goods and services pass from one state to the next, who gets to regulate that? Obviously not either of the states, so it has to be the federal government. So that's one thing Congress can do. So in order to get the Violence Against Women Act, they have to argue, not that it's in our best interest to protect women from violence, they have to argue that it has a financial impact, that it will if impact interstate commerce. Mm. And so the Equal Rights Amendment will create a totally new avenue where Congress can pass laws simply to prevent gender-based discrimination. This is huge. Um, this will, will allow, you know, these young, amazing new legislators we have like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ayanna Presley and all these new women um, with really interesting and, and forward-thinking ideas. It will provide them with a hook um, in the Constitution of the United States to pass laws to protect us. And so one example is there is a federal law right now against female genital mutilation. It was passed again using this interstate commerce clause. Um, a federal judge just last year struck down that law saying it was unconstitutional. So right now in America, we can't even get a law that protects women from mutilation because there is no way under our constitutional regime to pass that law, according to this judge. So the second clause um, will help us get uh, legislation, laws that protect us, and it will be huge. The amount and the types of laws that we'll be able to pass once we ratify the Equal Rights Amendment will help us build a totally new infrastructure to protect women. Awesome. Yeah. I, I like feel like I'm going to cry, especially <laughs> when I think about the way that that can positively impact, especially women of color. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, women of color have been leading the way on the Equal Rights Amendment yeah. since the beginning. Uh, you know, some of the women who fought uh, hardest for the Equal Rights Amendment, um, you know, Shirley Chisholm, mm -hmm. uh, who was the first black woman elected to Congress, Patsy Mink, who was the first woman of color ever elected uh, to the U.S. Congress. She was from Hawaii. And, uh, you know, these are the women who really led the way on the Equal Rights Amendment. And today, um, in all of the states where the Equal Rights Amendment bills are currently pending, uh, so there are still states uh, that have not ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, in all of those states, women of color are the ones who are taking the bills forward, primarily black women. So where it just passed in Virginia, for example, the Equal Rights Amendment was ratified in January of this year, mm -hmm. and that bill was sponsored by Jennifer Carroll Foy in uh, the House, and it was uh, sponsored by Jennifer McClellan, another Black woman in the Senate. So women of color are really taking the Equal Rights Amendment forward. Yeah. Yeah. Are there, like, myths about the Equal Rights Amendment or human rights in general that you just want to, like, debunk into everyone's collective consciousness? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the one about abortion is the one that's most oft repeated about the ERA, uh, that it will introduce what they call abortion on demand into the Constitution. Um, I think in some ways they're right and in some ways they're wrong. We just disagree about whether that's good or bad. <laughs> um, yes, I do think that the Equal Rights Amendment will uh, protect our fundamental right to bodily autonomy and to uh, you know, uh, accessing the healthcare that we need. This includes abortion. Currently, the abortion uh, under the constitution is found in the right of privacy. Uh, so we already have the constitutional right under Roe versus Wade, uh, a case that was decided in 1973 to access abortion. And we didn't need the Equal Rights Amendment for that. Mm -hmm. However, Roe versus Wade since that time has been slowly chipped away. And uh, this attack under this sort of um, right to privacy that the justices found has been relentless. So I think the Equal Rights Amendment would help in that uh, it would create a new right uh, and a new 
part of the Constitution uh, upon which people can litigate these cases uh, to protect that access. I mean, I don't want the Equal Rights Amendment if it's not going to protect my most basic bodily autonomy. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yes, I do think that the Equal Rights Amendment will protect, again, what we already have, which is access to abortion. I think the thing where they get it wrong is that this will be a totally unfettered uh, right and that no one, that there will be no restrictions possible and that no one can pass any abortion laws. Uh, That's actually just not true. All rights have restrictions. Uh, None of the rights in the constitution are absolute. Um, Rights to free speech are not absolute. you, you know, the Second Amendment, which was one of the strongest amendments, uh, which protects the right to bear arms. There are still restrictions that are available. There are gun laws. There should be more gun laws. Uh, But you can restrict, the government can restrict if they can prove that it, you know, it's in the interest of public safety or that they have a legitimate reason to restrict a fundamental right. So that will still also be true of abortion. It will just be harder to get through these stupid, arbitrary, punishing laws that are called trap laws Mm -hmm. um, that really are just meant to punish women for accessing the health care they need. Yeah, I think is trap targeted regulation of abortion providers. Is that what that is? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So aptly named. Yes. (laughs) It's a trap. Yep. (laughs) Every time. Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier uh, how a lot of the arguments against the ERA are pretty outdated, um, and that came across in the podcast in your conversation with Phyllis Schla- Schlafly's daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like I hear that not in the same way, uh, and not necessarily about the ERA, but just I get... Um, Arguments, especially from like extended family members, that's just based on like bad information or outdated information. Um, Whereas like, I'm not really interested in my uncle Gary's opinion on this. Like I'm interested in experts opinions on that. And I just don't really know how to, I guess, how do you um, respond to people like Phyllis Schlafly's daughter, whose arguments are demonstrably false, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the part of the problem with your Uncle Gary uh, <laughs> is that he's a voter. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it is important that we convince people, particularly people in our lives, uh, to respect our most basic rights. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we're not always going to win those arguments, but I think it is important to bring them up when we can um, and stand our ground. And Part of the problem, too, is that they are unencumbered by facts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, it sometimes doesn't matter because what they're arguing is really an emotional argument. And the right is actually very, very good at this and incredibly adept at making emotional arguments. So I use the example of the draft in the 1970s. Uh, Phyllis Schlafly and her Stop ERA movement would go to protests and they would have women dressed in army fatigues and drench them in blood and have them show up and say, you know, your housewives are going to be dragged to the front lines of the war. And, you know, it doesn't even really have to be true Mm -hmm. because what it's meant to do is evoke an emotional response. And one of the strongest emotional responses is fear. Mm -hmm. So what they're really trying to do is scare you. And that isn't it. That's very hard to combat with facts, like to come back from with something like that and just be like, well, statistically speaking, like, blah, blah, you know, it's like, it's kind of hard to counter such a compelling emotional argument with facts. Um, So I say in those situations, uh, especially if it's with someone you can have a reasonable, you know, discourse or, or a conversation that's legitimate and and, you know they're they're willing to listen um i would just you know go back to those uh, a lot of like i said a lot of these arguments are outdated and so say like you know it used to be like that but it's not like that anymore or you know what about that scares you Hmm. you know for example um with uh one of the things the stop 
ERA movement. It was called Stop Taking Our Privileges. That was what the acronym symbolized. And a lot of women at the time, especially housewives, were afraid that their benefits that they thought the government, you know, passed laws to benefit them would be in jeopardy. And so I think sometimes it's worth, you know, digging down in that, you know, what about that scares you? What, you know, what, why do you think you're in a vulnerable position and kind of trying to get at the emotional aspects of the argument um, as opposed to facts, because sometimes just going back and forth uh, isn't going to be very fruitful. I feel like there's a lot of good public health lessons to be learned out of that. Katie and I met because we both worked at the same public health department and <laughs> I still work in public health and we've had to do a lot of that right now with COVID of like, okay, yeah. I understand that you're scared. We're going to approach this in a way that like right. validates that, but it also tells you what what's actually happening here mm -hmm. and that no 5G towers are not causing this. <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That's a good approach, I think, for a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. So um, Alice Paul, who you, know, you talk about in the podcast and, you know, was initially writing um, this still to be ratified piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. um, she was a complex person, um, mm -hmm. just like all of us. If you could sit down and have dinner with her today, um, you know, 40 something years after she passed and almost a hundred years after the first version of the ERA was written up, what would you be excited to tell her about the world today? Yeah. I mean, Alice Paul is this incredible woman, uh, who at, you did things that at the time were completely unthinkable. She was one of the suffrage, uh, advocates, suffragists who really amplified the cause and kind of got the 19th amendment over the finish line by picketing at the white house, doing a bonfire in front of the white house of the president's speeches. Um, they went to jail, they did hunger strikes, like they did crazy, very elevated tactics that no one had ever seen before. Uh, she planned a parade the day before the inauguration to steal his thunder uh, no such parade had ever taken place in washington dc like she was wild mm -hmm. um and very inspirational in many ways uh but of course she made some mistakes and for example that parade uh she ordered the women of color particularly specifically black women to march in a segregated unit in the back because she was told by um, Southern delegates that if women marched in an integrated fashion, that it would remove all support from Southern delegates. So she sort of kowtowed to white supremacy and ordered black women to march in the back of the parade. That was a mistake. Uh, and that mistake of sort of selling out or overlooking women of color uh, continued throughout her life. So once the 19th amendment was ratified, um, women, black women, including Mary Church Terrell and other women went to her and said, okay, now we have the 19th amendment, but it, for all intents and purposes, it means almost nothing for black women. We're not going to be able to vote in the South because of these Jim Crow laws and other, uh, specific cultural and legal barriers to us actually, you know, exercising the franchise. And essentially, Alice Paul just said, no, like, we, we don't care. Um, we're, uh, well, or maybe more diplomatically, she said, that's not the direction the movement is going. And so they immediately pivoted to the Equal Rights Amendment, which was always what she, what she had always envisioned, you know, fuller e equality within the Constitution. Uh, but that was at the expense of making the, the vote a reality for many women in this country. And so I think one thing that we can kind of learn from these super complicated, flawed individuals who both did incredible things and made really, you know, unfortunate mistakes, um, you know, I would ask her... Uh, you know, I would tell her about the movement. I'm sure she'd be excited, but also appalled that we still haven't ratified it. <laughs> um, you know, Alice Paul, when they, when they uh, finally got the ERA passed in both houses in 1972, uh, they went to find Alice Paul and she was actually weeping because she knew that 
at the time that the seven year deadline would kill the amendment. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and it turns out she was right. That was a prophetic, a prophetic um, idea. Mm -hmm. So I would tell her about the movement now. I would probably like tell her about intersectional feminism. (laughs) Good answer. (laughs) And, you know, these these ideas of overlapping oppressions and like have a discussion about that. And, you know, ask her looking back if she had any regrets or would have done anything differently. We can only sort of see with our own lens. Um, But, you know, it, I don't think we should give these people the benefit of the doubt in that, like, oh, it was just a product of the times and everyone was racist then, mm-hmm. because that's not true. Mm-hmm. Um, there were many suffragists, white suffragists, who did not want women of color to be relegated to the back. They did not want to give up the, the fight for enfranchisement in the South. Um, and leaders like Alice Paul took it forward knowing um that other women dissented so it was it wasn't just a product at the times it was it was a conscious decision Mm -hmm. a political calculation she made and it was the wrong decision so I think yeah I think it's interesting looking back um if she had any regrets or if she if she would have done things differently yeah it that reminds me um of course like everybody makes mistakes it is kind of cool that the women's right move, rights movement has um, really like looked at those and acknowledged them and it um, that is why women of color are leading the way now uh, but it reminds me of and you talk about this in the podcast too that how Republicans are trying to use trans rights as a wedge issue in terms of the equal rights amendment Um, Can you explain kind of what a wedge issue is and maybe like how to identify one and maybe how to um, respond to bad faith arguments? Um, Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So um, again, Republicans are very smart (laughs) Uh, and they are very skilled. Uh, They're very skilled at division. Mm -hmm. And that's really what a wedge issue does is it, it divides people. Um, and tr- tries to divide people who otherwise would have everything in common or would work together or find common cause. Um, and so race was an issue for the suffragists in the past and continues to be an issue for the feminist movement today. Um, and I would say um, the issue of transgender women is an issue that has really continues to divide. And it it divides somewhat along generational lines. Mm. So a lot of second wave feminists um, of a previous generation who, um, you know, have some very transphobic ideas uh, and are punitive and exclusionary when it comes to trans women. And Republicans are just all out, full on, 100%, like, bigoted you know, nasty towards trans people and do not want them to have additional rights. Mm -hmm. That's true of some feminists, um, you know, the worst of the worst. But um, I think they kind of use this issue to scare women. It's, um, you know, they use the issue of trans women and, you know, use all kinds of scare tactics about them playing in sports competitions Mm -hmm. and going to the same restrooms as women um, all of these things that are just not actual legitimate concerns, but are being used to pit women against other women. And so I think the Equal Rights Amendment is actually a good opportunity for us to unite around this issue and say, yes, trans women are women. And yes, of course, trans people will be covered by the Equal Rights Amendment. It does not actually have the word women in it. Um, it simply says on the basis of sex. So on the basis of sex means if people receive discrimination on the basis of sex, that can be men, that could be women, that could be people um, along the entire spectrum, that can be non-binary people. Um, And so I think we need to reimagine this amendment as protecting all types of people and not let, um, you know, bigots who don't want any of us to have rights (laughs) to control the discourse or to divide us. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about 
our constitution compared to constitutions in other developed nations in terms of how old it is and how easy it is to update? Yeah, so our constitution uh, is one of the oldest and uh, one of the most intransient. So it's one of the hardest to amend. It's very infrequently amended. And that was written into the process. So Article 5 of the Constitution dictates the, the uh, ratification process for new amendments. Many other countries will like rewrite an entirely new constitution every so often. Um, their constitutions are easier to amend. Um, or again, they'll just like start whole cloth and like have a new document. Um, and so ours is really hard to change and has been around for a really long time. So that's why Supreme Court justices are kind of like, you know, using what they can find in it to kind of wiggle around and uh, find rights that are protected as our society changes, as, you know, um, we progress. So it's very, very difficult. Um, uh, the vast, vast majority of the rest of uh, countries have uh, a gender provision in their in their constitutions. Uh, I think it's eighty four percent. So we are just way behind mm -hmm. when it comes to um, gender protection in our law. Um, many other countries have used their ERAs, their their country's version of the ERA, to get all kinds of protections for women, um, to do really robust uh, programs for women, uh, and and really, you know, advance as a society. We're very, very far, far, far behind. We're one of the only, if not the only, industrialized nation uh, that has no paternal or maternal leave mm. uh, when when you have a child. Um, it's just, it's shameful uh, the way that we treat women in our country, particularly when you compare it to other countries uh, that have so many other benefits. So yeah. yeah, our constitution is really hard to change. And that is one of the reasons we have so few enumerated rights. Mm. It is weird that people just, we decided these rich white misogynists from years and years and years and years ago were the smartest people that were ever going to exist in this country and we're just gonna go with that from now on yeah i mean many of the founding fathers were also um slave owners and slave breeders so they not only ha had terrible ideas about women, but they literally held women as property. And so they bought and sold women uh, and had a financial interest in their lacking citizenship and lacking rights. Um, and that applied to Native women, that applied to the system of chattel slavery, uh, that applied to their own wives um, and, and families at the time. So yeah, it's shocking that <laughs> there are there are people currently today on the court who call themselves originalists. Mm -hmm. And the originalists are people who think the only way the constitution should be interpreted today is how those dudes would, you know, in 1776 would have interpreted it. And that's pretty scary. I know. Um, <laughs> like I don't know if I'm smarter than I'm smarter than them but i'm definitely not as racist so like maybe yeah, i should be in charge yeah. of some stuff really we've really got that going for us yeah um i didn't i don't own people right so I've, yeah. i got that going for me but again i think it's important to remember that it wasn't just a product of the times like some of them were slave owners but other people weren't mm -hmm. like there were people who were not slave owners at the time there were people who didn't have plantations there were people who you know um, fought that system even at the time and said that it was immoral and spoke out against it and sacrificed so much, including enslaved women themselves. So it wasn't just like a product of the times. Like these dudes were not only the richest, some of the richest people in the world at the time, the way that they got their wealth was taking land from native people who were already here and uh, through a system of chattel slavery. So taking land and owning people is how they amassed wealth. Mm -hmm. And then somehow they were the moral arbiters 
of the time and and that has extended to now which just makes absolutely no sense like they were terrible dudes then Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they are still terrible dudes now like it's not just with the lens of history even at the time uh they were robber barons yeah and the system the system they set up is for other terrible men so yeah why it's ironic because it's the same thing now yeah Yeah. it (sighs) perpetuates it perpetuates a system where people like them disproportionately benefit from the labor of other people. Mm-hmm. And uh, a friend of mine who was on the podcast, Rebecca Hall, um, calls it is, is a document that's affirmative action for slaveholders. That's what it is. That's what the entire U.S. Constitution is. Um, and so it's hard <laughs> looking back and saying like, this is ideal. And like, this is going to get us justice and liberty uh, because that original vision only applied to a very, very small group of people and no women. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know we kind of did talk about earlier how like it's a, just going to be this sweeping infrastructure once this is ratified in this change. Um, are there other ways that America might look or feel different once the ERA is completely ratified, um, whether that's, you know, broad or whether that's just like how it might feel to you and um, people in your life that you, you know, spoke yeah. to about this? I mean, the Equal Rights Amendment will change the U.S. Constitution. So every kid that gets a pocket constitution in middle school, when they're learning about our law and our country's founding, will take that constitution out and gender equality will be one of the provisions. Uh, I think that says a lot and will change a lot about who we are as a people. You know, is gender equality an American value? I think some people would dispute that. (laughs) Um, But once we get this in the Constitution, our most basic and foundational document, gender equality is an American value once and for all. And every kid in this country will learn about it. And so I think there will be an immediate impact uh, and shift in the way that people think about gender in the way that it's reflected in the law. Um, It will take years, if not centuries, which is what it's taken for other amendments to be fully realized or implemented. But that I think will be the immediate impact. Um, And I think there's something to be said for women to see ourselves reflected in our laws and see ourselves reflected in this document that is so revered and talked about reverently and treated as though it is sort of a scriptural document um, or that it's you know ordained by God or that these, these visionary men have written it. I think it is um, a flawed document that needs to be altered. Um, and once we get ourselves into this document once and for all, <laughs> which has taken us a, 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 you know, almost a century to do, Um, since it was first proposed, I think um, this place, this country will be more free. Uh, How worried should we be about Roe versus Wade? I think we should be really worried about Roe versus Wade, but we have been really worried about Roe versus Wade since it was passed. I mean, there have been dozens of cases that have chipped away at the foundation that was provided in Roe versus Wade. That was a shocking decision that many, even in the pro-choice movement, did not think we were going to get. And while it's a flawed decision um, and limited, it it legalized abortion everywhere (laughs) immediately and since then we've actually gone backwards um we have lost clinics we have lost access in many states there is only one clinic operating and women go for hundreds of miles which without having access to this really basic health procedure so i think we should be afraid of roe because we have been afraid for many many years if not decades and uh, the 
anti-choice movement has been slowly chipping away at that decision for decades since it was uh, decided by the Supreme Court and they will not rest until Roe versus Wade is overturned, which will mean at the bare minimum that some states have no access um, and that some states will have access, but you will have to fly there to, to get it. So um, that's what happened before Roe. Um, there were some, uh, you know, there were women who flew to London. There were women who flew to Mexico. There were women. And then a few states opened up, California, New York. Um, so women would have to fly to New York to get this procedure. But that's very expensive, uh, very time consuming. It's in an unknown place. If you already have kids, which the, the majority of women who get abortions already have kids, um, so if you already have kids, you have no one to take care of them. I mean, it's just a really obscene uh, thing to have to go to another state to get a routine medical procedure. Um, so yes, I think we should be afraid um, because they are not masking their goals. <laughs> their explicit goal is to overturn Roe versus Wade. And then um, I guess one of my uh, last questions is kind of a fun one is, do you have someone you would like to nominate as either the awesome person we should celebrate this week or our asshole of the week? <laughs> For context, we have this continuum yeah. <laughs> that lives up above my bed. So oh, nice. on the far end, you obviously have Hitler. And then on the good end, it goes all the way over to Chris Evans because okay. he's the best. Okay. And then like... Over here, you got Mitch McConnell, Jared Kushner, Scott Pruitt. So just so that you you see like who else is kind of company we're talking about. And then like Mitt Romney's kind of in the middle. Joe Biden's kind oh, of in the funny. middle. Funny. Okay, we're trying to give people to context. Man? No. It is not. No. Kelly Loeffler's up there too. Okay. Great. Great. Um, I, uh, does it also have to be fa super famous? No. Nope. Okay. Um, I would, I will nominate, uh, as super awesome person <laughs> of the century and of the year, uh, the, a woman named Senator Pat Spearman. Okay. Um, she is a Senator from Nevada who really reignited the equal rights amendment battle in 2017. And she got the amendment ratified there mm -hmm. in 2017. So it was the first state to ratify since 1977 um, and she really resurrected this entire fight for women's fundamental equality in the U.S. Also, she's a Baptist preacher. Also, she's queer. She's awesome. Nice. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> That's a really good I answer. We will talk about her. We're doing episodes on swing states. Yeah. Nice. Um, so yeah, she's definitely going to come back up again on the podcast when we do our Nevada <laughs> episode. It she's also, it's exciting to have somebody to put on the good side because- yeah. Yeah. It's getting really crowded over there. We've nice. been really bad about nominating like people that we oh, like. Yeah. So. yeah. There's just so many bad people to talk about. Yeah. Well, that's good people. Unfortunately, these days. Oh. <laughs> and I hate how much attention they get. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, so we, we usually try to end the podcast um, where we give examples of the political actions that we're taking this week. Um, so easy ones are obviously to follow you, Kate Kelly, and Ordinary Equality. Um, Ordinary Equality is an awesome podcast that Morgan and I like cannot promote enough and talk about enough. Um, yeah, we but, listened like twice. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yes, that we love. <laughs> uh, but is there anybody, any like easy actions that you would recommend people taking, even if it's just like following on social media or, or anything yeah, that I you mean, can think of? Yeah, I mean, I think of? the most direct action that you can take on uh, getting the Equal Rights Amendment ratified right now is supporting Senate Joint Resolution 6. So there is a resolution currently pending in the Senate uh, to eliminate the deadline. So to eliminate that original uh, 1982 deadline and get the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution. It passed already in February of 2020 in the House, and so it's it's gone to the Senate. So if you um, live in a state, particularly if you live in a state with Republican senators, <laughs> I think all of the Democrats have co-sponsored it at this point, and mm -hmm. two Republicans, Susan Collins, 
uh, and Murkowski have mm-hmm. both uh, co-sponsored it. So if you live in a place with even a like mildly or potentially reasonable senator who is a Republican, uh, contact them. Let them know that there should be no deadline on equality. I will try. Um, I live in Iowa, so I have Chuck Grassley and Joni Ernst to deal with. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So not I don't know. Worst, if, not I don't know if reasonable fits, but we can try. I have gotten responses when I have written them before. I mean, nice. from their interns, but you know. Yeah. All I right. Think, well, that's great. Yeah, that's great that, that's probably the best and most direct action people can take. Awesome. Um, and then we usually also donate to an organization, pick a different, um, but we thought we would let you choose uh, this week who we should donate to. Cool. Well, I um, suggest a youth-led organization. Uh, it's called Generation Ratify. Awesome. And it is a organization that was started by a 15-year-old girl uh, and is all completely youth led. Most of the people are under 18 in the group and they have chapters. I think they're in eight different States. Um, so they're expanding new chapters to different States, uh, and they're really incredible. So it's a gen, uh, gen Z is my favorite generation. (laughs) That is so awesome. Yeah. I love that. Generation ratify is incredible. They're the most incredible teenagers I've ever met. Good. Oh, We're in so good cool. hands. Yes, that makes me so happy. I will say even just like the little bit of time that I spend around middle schoolers, high schoolers, and younger kids these days, like they are clearly growing up with a very different mindset about equality and about gender and sex. Consent, and yeah. It's, it's so awesome. Mm-hmm. Like I just love it so much. I love them. I'm like, okay, I'm going to retire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We'll let these kids take it from here. Right. Um, yeah, I'm very inspired uh, by all of these movements for justice, including March for Our Lives and, you know, all of these kids just standing up. And and the fact that young, very, very young people, you know, people who can't even vote yet are really organized and energized about the Equal Rights Amendment gives me a lot of hope. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's very cool. I don't know if I was doing anything that cool at 15. I was like playing soccer, Mm -hmm. you know, like, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, I was running a lot. And I think I, that was about it. (laughs) I had like a nerdy philanthropy organization for teenagers that I was part of. Oh my gosh, that's so you. Yeah, I know. (laughs) We named ourselves Go For It. Of course you did. (laughs) Like so cute. And I hope that it still exists. That's (laughs) amazing. (laughs) Oh gosh, that's so great to hear. Um, And then we also like to always do some kind of little self-care tip at the end. Um, Is there anything that keeps you going on those days when you look at social media and look at the headlines and you're just like, why? Yeah, I mean, I am like a very, very, very political person. So um, the thing that I do to step away from social media is just read books but I mostly just read books about politics and abortion (laughs) and the equal rights amendment and like history and whatever but it doesn't matter read whatever you want if you're a political person and you can't step away um just read a book about it that's what I suggest at least the book like what we've been doing yeah yeah Yeah, a book can't write a shitty comment back to you true So. true so true oh I love it um Oh, gosh. Well, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk with us. Um, This has been awesome. Yes. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate you giving us your time. Of course. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Oh, my gosh. We appreciate your podcast so much, too. For sure. Um, Like, and all the other amazing work you have done and continue to do, but yeah, we I was we were so excited when we they found that that podcast existed. We were like, wow, like this is great. We need to talk about this. Yeah. I'm so excited. I'm working on season two us. right now. So. Awesome. Do you know when that might come out? Oh, <laughs> no pressure. It's okay. We will not ask for any spoilers. <laughs> Right. podcasting as you know is quite a lot of work it is it really is yeah so we come out with an episode every monday that's about kind of like a more general topic so next week will be the equal rights amendment and then we've started coming out on thursdays with mini episodes about each swing state about what's going on in your state and what 
if you have a senator up or if you're trying to like flip the state house or whatever. And yeah, who knew adding a whole extra podcast would be a lot of work. Or a I am so grateful for this like quarantine life because I don't know how I would have time otherwise because yeah. I have social yeah. obligations. It's like as an extrovert that can't say no. I, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm so glad. Thank God for podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Thank oh, you so much. Thank you. So, awesome. so happy. Thank you. <laughs> we'll tag you when we post our post our yeah, episode cool. okay. for sure. Yes, Amazing. we definitely will. Okay. Um, thank you, Kate. Monday, Thanks for out. doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Have Bye. a good day. Bye. Thank you. Okay. So we got some great examples of action to take from Kate Kelly mm-hmm. um, about um, reaching out to your senators about Senate Joint Resolution 6 to eliminate the deadline and help the ERA move along um, off the desk of people like Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also to donate to the youth-led organization Generation Ratify, which is what we're going to do this week. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage everybody else to as well if you are able. Um, Katie, what else are you up to this week? Um, what am I up to this week? You've done some baking. I have done some baking. What was the very first thing that you said? You, uh, what did Kate? Senate joint resolution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, so in my opinion, the easiest way to do that is with resist bot with at texting 50409. You can text, um, especially if you're, li- you live in a state with Republican senators. So if you live in a swing state, you probably do. Um, there are more red trifectas than there are blue trifecta. Or mm-hmm. just so anyway, if you have a Republican senator, please text them at uh, to resist by at five zero four zero nine and ask them to s- co-sponsor Senate Resolution Six. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then that would go a long way towards. Um, ratifying the equal rights amendment which for some reason has still not happened yeah. and if you get a response from any of your senators especially if it's positive um like screenshot and send it to us oh and God, then yes. we can put them on like maybe the good side of our continuum yes. which we realized today we don't have enough people on pretty sparse uh, um, but pat spearman and kate kelly are both going on sure. the <laughs> far far right side of the continuum right up there with good Chris guy Evans. side so yeah. we are always happy to add some more good guys. What um, else did I do this week? Um, I went to my usual Zoom meeting with my Indivisible group on Monday. So we wrote some more letters. Um, we set a goal last week to write 5,000 letters between now and the end of um, the Big Send campaign with Vote Forward. So those letters will get sent on October 27th. We already have... As a group, we have 485 written of our 5,000 letter goal. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, So I'm going to be keeping track of that. I also now have access to my Indivisible Group's Instagram page. So I'm hoping to put some content on there and get some more people involved with our letter writing campaign. Um, And then on Sunday, so the day day right before this comes out, unfortunately, Sister District is hosting a sour bread starter. Uh, like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got an email about that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to make sourdough starters, and the idea of a sourdough starter is confusing as fuck to me. So, I registered for it. So, it's kind of the same idea as our trivia. Um, it's with Sister District, and instead, you, um, in order to participate in trivia, you, it was suggested that you donate 10 to 25 dollars. This is kind of the same thing in order to participate in this sourdough starter workshop you pay uh you donate a certain amount of money i think i donated like 15 bucks actually no i donated 20 dollars and 20 cents 2020 nice. um and it's split between Lori Pahutsky, who's the um woman the from we michigan who that yeah. we did trivia for and then it's also split between her and robin her last name is spelled vining v-i-n-i-n-g but whenever people pronounce it different letter sounds come out and I don't remember what the right way to say it is so anyway it's the it's Lori Pahutsky's equivalent but in Wisconsin (laughs) anyway it's a nice lady that we hope wins and so I donated some money to her and I'm gonna learn how to bake some bread 
Well, I'm going to plug another podcast. The Ologies podcast had an episode about sourdough bread, about like ancient mm. grains and like mm. bread baking. So just to say, if you wanted to get a little bit of a head start there. Nice. Um, it's very fascinating. I will. I'm the, like, glad bacteria to. Bacteria that are involved in it and stuff. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah, that puts so me at 40 more, cool. 40 more letters for the week. But I think that's about all that I did this week. But I'm excited about that stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, as most people probably know by now, Pride Month is coming up, but it's also canceled. <laughs> so it's like Pride Month is in June, but it's canceled, um, which is the smart and wise and sensible thing to do. Um, and, but like, because Pride Month is very important to me, um, I oh. found one of my pro- favorite professional athletes, a runner, of course, um, is sponsoring a virtual 5K fundraiser for the trevor project which is such an awesome lgbtq plus organization very important to me um and like literally tons and tons of people in this world so i signed up for that um which like means like i paid money and i'm gonna go run and then not just like by myself for it but um, okay so that's what that's what a virtual 5k is is you pay like you would if it was like a fun run that you you know paid $40 $40 to, and then you get a t-shirt and then, you know, a couple hundred people get together and mm-hmm. main, on main street and go run three miles. It's like that, but I'll just like run by myself. Nice. Yeah. And yeah. And it's great because it's a fundraiser for a very important cause and a very important organization. Um, just a very important group. of Do people. you self report fine. your time? Yes, generally, but you don't, don't have to, but a lot of the time you do, you like take a picture of your watch or screenshot your like Garmin or Strava or whatever, and just like tweet it with like a hashtag or. Got it. Or, yeah. You know, winners or losers in this one, which is fine. Um, I mean, I'm not as fast as I used to be. So, you know, I would lose and that makes me sad. <sighs> yeah I'm like I'm very excited for it you're supposed to and it's also just kind of like a solidarity thing so it's not technically until June mm. so I I guess I'm like training for it nice um yeah it just like feels really good to know how many great things are still going on for pride month despite the fact that there's not really any pride month due to a pandemic yeah for sure yeah and then in terms of like things this week that have just made me so happy um in addition to like this whole episode right now i watched um becoming over the weekend Mm. the michelle obama documentary i haven't seen it yet well i cried Mm. it was just so lovely like i i cried um i loved her book um highly recommend the audiobook for that one because she reads it herself Mm -hmm. so Anytime it's like somebody's own story and then they're going to read it themselves. Always, always go the audiobook route. I cried. I loved it. Um, it's carrying me through this whole week. So. Nice. I, yeah. I might watch it today. I'll, I'll definitely watch it before the end of the week. Good deal. What about you? What you um, I've been watching The Last Dance, the oh. Bulls um, documentary or Good mini-series. Chicagoan. Yes. Well, I... Yeah, I feel like I'm being educated on stuff I definitely should have already known, but it's still exciting. Um, <laughs> all of our water, my water polo cheers from high school were from the Bulls, which I didn't realize. And a bunch of our like offensive plays were also Bulls plays, which I didn't realize. That's hilarious. Isn't well, you weird? also didn't realize Dennis Rodman and Scottie Pippen were different people. Yeah, I, I, okay. <laughs> I think I, if you probably, if you were like Katie, are Dennis Rodman and Scottie Pippen, like, if you put a lineup of people, basketball players in front of me, I guess I probably would have been like, yeah, it makes sense. They have two different names. They're definitely two different people. But like in my head, they looked like the same person. But now I'm like, oh, no, obviously Dennis Rodman is the crazy looking one. And Scottie Pippen just has a lot of, like, swag. Like, I'm so into Scottie Pippen. Also, I have a brief complaint I need to make. Okay. The man that I dated for a really long time, mostly in college and right after college, who obviously knew me very well because we dated for six years and almost got married, he 
used to tell me, he used to compare me to Michael Jordan. And now I am seeing that Michael Jordan is kind of a dick. And I'm confused about the comparison because, okay, so I think the way he meant it is that I would talk trash about competitors that like weren't really competitors. It'd probably be like you talking trash about like Kate Kelly, like once you were not the one we interviewed, the one that you ran track against. Oh, I was like, I would never. I know. Uh, But like after you were already better than her. So I think that's what he meant. Uh, but I took it like now I watched the most recent episode of The Last Dance and he like he's a dick. He's a bad teammate. He's so mean to all of his other and I never yeah. was like that. Never, never, never. I so, love MJ, but yeah. <laughs> that he <laughs> MJ's Michael Jackson, but yeah. I, I don't think the way he yeah. like goes about getting the best out of people is effective at all. I so, think he even said in an interview, he's like, after people watch the da- last dance, they're gonna hate me. They're gonna mm. think I'm an asshole, which like, is true after you watch it. Yeah. Maybe like, yeah. <laughs> I would like some clarification on in which ways I am and am not like Michael Jordan, please and thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think anybody who makes it that far in sports can maybe have a little bit of that sometimes, especially a sport like basketball. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit different if it's a super mainstream sport, but yeah. also, yeah, maybe he is a total dick. I mean, if I was on his team, I would have like had panic attacks on my way out of the NBA. Like there's just no way I would have ever. Yeah. I don't know, but whatever. Thanks for making the Bulls excellent for a long time, I guess. Yeah. I mean, thank you, Michael Jordan. I definitely sobbed the first time he retired watching his last Aww. game. I sobbed. I was like literally hugging the TV. I think I even kissed the TV. That's am- and then hilarious. my dad was like, what are you doing? Why are you kissing I the have TV? no memory of it. I was so upset. I mean, that was a long time ago too. Like I, that TV didn't even have a remote. I, I was going to say, you must have been dial. pretty little. Yeah. Yeah. Like I remember being so sad though. I made them tape it on a VHS v- and then somebody taped something else over it. Like a wedding or a birth? No. Oh, God. Nobody in my family taped things <laughs> like weddings and births. Um, probably like a made-for-TV movie. Okay. But which and one? I was so pissed. What, what like if it was a, a kid, Disney Channel a, or definitely, original? It was definitely a kid's movie. Yeah, I don't mm-hmm. remember which one, but I remember like that a kid's movie got taped over. It was probably Land Before Time. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, maybe so worth mad. it. Maybe worth it. Land it before, could be. Land Before Time is yeah. a great movie. Yeah. I wanted to eat a tree star so bad. They just yes. looked so delicious. Okay. I bet we could figure out how to bake something that like looks like a tree star. Tree stars. Really yeah. All right. Okay. We're, we're very off topic and we're sorry, but we are like drunk on our excitement about Kate Kelly. Yeah. Being on our podcast. We have, how many times have we said Kate Kelly this like last? Too many. So many times. Yeah. But we hope you're all doing well. Um, keep social distancing, I guess. Please. If you can. <laughs> At least wear a mask. Stop listening know. to Republican Wash your hands. Governors. It's been fun. It's been real. And we will be back next week with another episode. Yes. And in the meantime, stay sexy. And God bless Kate Kelly. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Thank you guys so much for listening to For Your Misinformation. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. And if you like it, give us a rating and a review. It helps us find more listeners. And the more of us there are, the better. And make sure you're following along on Instagram and Twitter at FYMIPod. Shout out to Kyle Dibdahl for the intro and outro music. Hope Die for the podcast art, and Ben Schlofelt for the audio production. We come out with new episodes every Monday.